and every tribe had its own particular way of living, in which dances like these often played an important part. Home for most Indians in the United States today is on a reservation, land which belongs to the tribe, either as the result of treaties made many years ago or through some other action of our national government. That was a clip from a 1950s film looking into the life of Native Americans throughout the United States. Today, about one in five Native Americans live on a reservation. The rest live in places just like you and me, houses around our own blocks. But for those who do live on a reservation, what's life like? Where are the jobs? That's a good question tonight, primarily because there's typically a high unemployment rate. The tribal and federal governments tend to be the largest employers on the reservations, but even those who do work earn below poverty wages. Where's the housing? Another good question, because there is not enough. Houses are usually overcrowded. Conditions are rough, especially when it comes to health. Look no further than a 2010 study which found the average life expectancy for Native Americans is five years lower than the average American. Big health concerns include heart disease, diabetes, and access to just good quality health care. Tonight on The Why, we're meeting two Native Americans working to change the future of their tribes and of America in two very different ways. But first, how did we get here? Where did these reservations come from? Why do they even exist? Do they exist today? To understand all that is to understand American history. In particular, some really dark chapters full of exploitation, even death. They're sometimes called Native Americans, sometimes American Indians or First Americans, and occasionally the forgotten minority. Their American experience is fundamentally different from that of white immigrants, and it's still partly defined by that long, dark shadow of the removal era of the 1830s and 40s. Another term for removal era was forced relocation. Native Americans forced off their lands. Others were killed. The Trail of Tears is probably the best known of mass relocations of Native Americans. It involved five different tribes in the southeast region of the U.S. 100,000 people were pushed from their homes to territory west of the Mississippi. In the end, 15,000 people died during that journey. Tribes in the Northeast and Midwest, they were also relocated during the period. Indian territory continually shrank as more and more white settlers headed west. That led to the Indian Appropriations Act of 1851, which established the reservation system. These were incredibly restrictive rules. People were not allowed to even leave the reservations. And the land set aside for reservations in the 1800s was generally the most worthless land that could be found. Next came the Dawes Act, 1887. It decreased reservation land by more than half, and it opened more land to white settlers and railroads. Dawes was replaced by the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934. This time, some land was returned to Native Americans. Today, there are 573 federally recognized American Indian tribes and 326 federal reservations. But not all tribes have a reservation. The largest is the 16 million acre Navajo Nation reservation located in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. The smallest, a 1.32 acre parcel in California where the Pitt River Tribe Cemetery is located. Some reservations are remnants of tribes' original land. Others are the result of the federal government just forcibly resettling groups. Life on the reservations has always been hard. Starvation, disease, feuding tribes forced onto the same reservation together, hunting tribes forced to be farmers. The list goes on and on. And even now, life is still hard on many reservations. A 2016 census report shows the median household income of single race American Indian and Alaska Native households was $38,530. That compares with $55,775 for the nation as a whole. Poverty in the Native people was 26.6%. That's the highest rate of any group. For a nation overall, 14.7%. And those lacking health insurance, 20.7%. For the nation as a whole, that percentage is 9.4%. But in 2018, more Native American candidates than ever in history are running for public office. It's part of a greater awareness and determination to boost visibility and equality in the years ahead. We met one of those candidates hoping to make history in the U.S. Congress. Deb Holland is her name. She's running for a House seat from New Mexico. She's a Democrat, a lawyer. She's anti-Trump, pro-universal health care. And if she wins, she would be the first ever Native American Congresswoman in U.S. history. Deb, you're running for the first congressional district in New Mexico. And in your ad, the very first thing you say is, 
I don't look like other people in Congress. And that's true. There has never been a Native American woman serving in Congress. Yes, it's a shock to most people, and most people don't believe it, that in almost 240 years and over 10,200 members of Congress elected over those 240 years, uh, we've never had a Native American woman. It hasn't been without trying. There have been a number of very strong, uh, wonderful Native women who have run for Congress. Um, and, you know, they haven't won for one reason or another. Why are you running? I am running because I, uh, first of all, I love my state. I'm a 35th generation New Mexican. Uh, I love New Mexico. I love the people here. I've, I've traveled all over the state many times, uh, talking to voters, getting folks to the polls. And so I feel very um, confident that the people of New Mexico deserve a strong voice in Congress, somebody who will fight for the issues that we all care about. How do Democratic candidates and Republican blend in the future that desire to be true to who they are and their legacy and what they are building and also not making it the only issue. If you're from um, a group of folks who have always been represented mm -hmm. uh, in Congress, if you can look uh, at this, you know, the sea of representatives sitting on the House of Congress and see yourself there, uh, then you can say that you know, you, you've always been represented, but for someone like me who's, who's looked at that body uh, for many years and have never seen myself in any of those seats, uh, then I think uh, I can say that, yes, uh, we've never had a Native woman in Congress, and, and it's something that I can say without regret. We've seen more Native Americans than ever this year saying, I'm tossing my hat in the ring, I want to do it either at the state level, federal level. I wonder what the reaction has been if if people have said you're making us proud or a lot is riding on you. What's the reaction been? I was the very first Native American woman state chair of a of a major political party in our country. And when I announced the votes on the floor of the uh, national convention in 2016, I got a, a, a Twitter message from a mom who said uh, her and her daughter watched me on TV. They were Native American from, um, I can't remember what state, South Dakota or something. And she messaged me a couple weeks later and said, my daughter and I watched you um, on the floor of, this, of the National Convention and I just wanted you to know that you inspired my daughter to run for student body president. So, um, so that gave me chills. Uh, it makes me proud to think that there's uh, young Native women across the country that might realize that, yeah, they can step up too. And I just think our country will be a better place when all of us have a seat at the table. So there's going to be a primary. It's a mostly blue district. Likely the Democrats going to win, but the primary field is a little crowded. I think there's five or six. Deb in fundraising is number two right now. So we'll see how the primaries go. Uh, here in the American culture in 2018, we talk a lot about diversity and equality. Black, Hispanic, uh, Muslim, women, trans, everything. But how often have you heard about or even thought about Native Americans when talking about America's future and diversity? Paul Chad Smith has spent his life on that very issue. He's curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and his new exhibit is called Americans, showing how Indians are everywhere you look but too rarely part of the important conversation. Most people who come here, they're mostly Americans, or mostly not Indians. They think they have nothing to do with American Indians. The country is a national project that came about at great expense to Native people. And what we've decided to do with this exhibition is prove that all Americans are deeply connected entangle with American Indians. And we do that by showing over 200 years of objects, images. Teach them, pale face brother, all about red man. Let's go! Let's go! This is not offensive. It is offensive. I am very Sorry. sorry. So in, in the room that we're in now, what you'll see is every kind of product that's ever been sold, you know, one time or another has probably had some Indian connection to it. So you have uh, brake fluid, um, you have different food items, you have 
pop stars, you have dolls, you have you name it. everything. And, and so, of course, everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows there's a Tomahawk missile, everybody knows there's a sports team. But what we argue and what I think we show in this exhibit is that it's been normalized, so we think it's, it's just kitsch, it doesn't really matter. And what we show is it's a really profoundly weird phenomenon that has no parallel. Land of Lakes margarine is made with fresh skim milk. Uh, Land of Lakes, I think, is one of the most interesting ones. Uh, it's, it's a brand that's um, yeah. extremely popular. And, and it's the best butter. And it's the best butter. And so when you look at it, what you see is the butter maiden is holding a box of the butter mm -hmm. with her image on it. So she's actually receding into infinity because she's in that image of that butter and mm -hmm. on and on and on. So it's a very... Um, kind of spooky uh, layer to it. So things that look like they're not important, we argue, take another look and you'll see there's more behind it. This is how embedded Americans are in popular culture and national identity in psyche. Mm -hmm. And we feel like that's the starting point we would have with our visitors to basically say you're part of all this. Which is the point. After you have been exposed to the butter and the, I'm sure there's a Brady Bunch episode, you know, and then once you've seen all that and that becomes your baseline to where it's not at all something you would even comment on later on. Uh, right, you, exactly. It, it's absolutely normal it, and it's almost always, all, very little of it is meant to be negative. Now whether it is negative is another issue, but it's always meant to be sentimental and positive and and all of that towards Indians. I think we're seeing a greater realization these days that many groups who maybe are not in the majority uh, or are not on the front page of the newspaper actually have um, profound impacts on us and our culture and the way we see the world. And I think that's starting to shift some in America. Speaking of, you know, 2018, the most in recent American history, uh, public officials running, Native Americans. Um, to go from something like novelty item to be a salt shaker to being a public official uh, and thought of in that way instead, that's a big shift. It is, and the project of the museum is always to talk about Indians in contemporary American life in, in you know, all facets, including the political arena. And the visual is sort of um, one aspect of it, of in, the, in what we call the wallpaper of American life. That was the exact word that was just in my head, is that Indians in America, I think, are wallpaper, but never the feature item. Right. They're never right, exactly. the feature of the story. It's a curtain to keep Americans from seeing actual Indians. So the project of, of uh, this institution and many others is to sort of give a more accurate description of who we are people come out of this exhibit, we hope they see the Indians in everyday life in D.C. as you know, Chesapeake, Anacostia, Potomac, Indian words, uh, the Indians in your pantry, you know, Calumet, Linda Lakes Butter, that you'll see, wow, it's kind of interesting. I don't see that with other groups. It's a really fantastic exhibit. You should go if you can. And I commented to Paul saying that, you know, it really just is to give you a reality check and open your eyes. And never in there do they say, you know, you've done us wrong, this is bad. Uh, instead, he said he just wanted to say, look at us and see us and include us. Very cool.